There we go. Right. Welcome, everyone, to the Pearson Business Book Club. My name is Eloise Cook, and I'm the publisher for the Professional Business List at Pearson. Um, if you're new, um, each month at the book club, we choose a Pearson business or personal development book, and we invite the author on to discuss it. They'll also give a masterclass on a key concept from the book. And if you need to leave halfway through, the video will be available to watch on demand at the book club website. I'm going to post that into the chat now before I forget. There we go. Right, okay. And our book this month is F Work, Let's Play. And I'm delighted to have John Williams uh, join us today. Hi, John. Hi, Eloise. Thanks for inviting me. That's all right. That's all right. I'm delighted you could be here. Um, so if you haven't got a copy yet, uh, you can download a sample chapter of the book from the Book Club web page. Um, link is in the chat. And um, if you have any questions for John, either now or, or during the masterclass, please use the Q&A function and we can we can quiz him at the end. Um, so, John, I'm going to introduce you first. Right, so I've, 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 found, I've found this found this bio. Um, so you're the founder of the Ideas Lab, the company that has helped thousands of people to find something they love, get it started and making a living out of it. You started your career in, the, in creative technology as a developer on pioneering special effects software, and you became digital media CTO at a startup before moving to head up a media technology consultancy team at Deloitte. But you quit and you said you never wanted another job for the rest of your life, which kind of brings us on perfectly to today. So, so welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Excellent. So, so how are you today, John? Is it, is it, is it cold and wintry where you are? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, it is. I'm looking forward to the, the, the weather getting a bit warmer. It's a bit sunny mm. down here in London at the moment. I'm sure it's worse elsewhere in the world, but uh, it's cold for me. Yes, yeah, we know what we're like in the UK. We love we love to talk about the weather. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm going to if I just stop sharing, I'm going to ask you some questions about the book. So we we ask these of, of all our authors at the start. So I'll I'll just quiz you a little bit. Um, can you tell me why did you want to write this book? What I noticed was uh, back, in, well, the, the original version was actually a, a few years back. And I noticed, because uh, it's a new edition, um, I noticed that people were still operating under the precepts of their parents' generation. And people hadn't quite twigged that you really could make a living out of anything. You make, if you were determined you, and you knew how to do it, you could make a living out of something you actually love doing. You don't have to settle for something that bores you to death and it seemed like some people had got that message but the majority of the population hadn't and that's why I thought it would be a good time to to lay out how you actually do that and, and also convince people at the same time mm, mm, yes and it's it's just such an inspirational title isn't it it gives us all gives us all a bit of hope yeah. um and yeah, yeah. and the second question was there anything that surprised you about writing this book um, I think I think it surprised me how much it resonated uh, because you know when I, as I was writing the book I, I felt like I'd, I hoped I'd done a good job but it was really it felt a little bit like I was in a vacuum uh, the first version at least and I had no idea what was going to happen and then the week it came out the, the first edition came out it was in the Sunday Times Star magazine uh, it was in the WH Smith Top 20 uh, I got chosen it was described on the buzz books the summer uh, and then it, you know, it went on to be translated into nine languages. So that was uh, obviously you hope for these things when you're writing a book. But I had no idea really whether it was just going to go out there and people would just go like, "Who's this crazy person?" Um, and it turned out that it was that was not the case. It was uh, people were really were ready for the message, and um, and I think most people are on board now. Or maybe I'm still in a bit of a bubble, but I think most people believe that you can at least improve that kind of uh, enjoyment versus slogging away quotient in your work. Mm, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and so last question, how do you want readers to feel about reading your book? 
I think the thing I really love doing is, is showing people how possible it is. So I'm not into pie in the sky stuff of, uh, you know, do what you love and the money will drop out of the sky, because I think that's nonsense. It will, it may or may not, depending on whether you've said it, uh, hit some other criteria. So I'm going to talk about what those other criteria are and also just make it really doable so that you could literally go away at the end of this talk and start and uh, to do it in a way that's not terrifying as well. So yeah, the, the, the sense of possibility. Great, great. Well, well, this is really exciting. I, I think we've timed this perfectly for the end of the year because I know that I'm sort of thinking about, you know, what does next year bring? You know, what what do I want to challenge myself with? So I'm I'm ready, I'm ready to hear sort of how to plan that. So I'm going to hand over to you, John. Um, and as a reminder, if, if anyone wants to um, ask a question for the end or, or during, um, please use the Q&A function. All right, over to you. Great. Okay, well, as the book says right at the beginning, we've reached a remarkable moment in time. You, can, you really can now make a living out of absolutely anything if you're determined. Whatever you can think of, someone somewhere in the world is making a career out of it, no matter how kind of bizarre and <laughs> obscure it might be. And I've got some really good examples in the book. So um, Sam Bompas and Harry Parr, for instance, they did quirky food experiments in breathable with, with breathable cocktails and architectural jellies, and they grew it into um, an international 12-person flavor studio, which the story is in the book about that. Adam Wilder fosters human intimacy with silent dating events and togetherness workshops. And he also ran a once, uh, once got the world record for spooning, uh, getting people to, uh, to spoon each other in a very safe way. <laughs> Petra Barron grew her love of street food into two organizations, Eat Street and Curve Food, that changed food, food culture in the UK in particular forever. Um, David Crane uses passion for psychology and the experience of giving up smoking to create the world's number one stop smoking app called Smoke Free. And uh, I just want to check, can you actually see me or are you seeing Eloise at the moment? Because it looks a little bit like um, the camera's stuck on Eloise. Let me know in the chat and because uh, I'm going to be asking you to interact a little bit as we go along. This will be a good test. You can see me. That's good. Great. Um, so I'm, uh, let me go back to um, my view that I was on before. Yeah, so why aren't more people doing this if it's actually possible? And as Eloise mentioned, I've been helping people for 15 years now, I believe we're out of time, help, and, and have helped thousands of people to do exactly this, to, to go some way down that path, sometimes all the way, sometimes helping them with part of it, to do what they love and get paid for it. And what I've noticed is that there are three problems that come up a lot that get in the way and stop people getting paid to do what they love. And the first is choosing what you're actually going to do. Second is acting on your ideas. And the third is getting paid for them. So I'm going to talk about each of those today. And I will, as I say, make it a little bit interactive. And I'm going to stop my watch from interrupting me every five minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to get your kind of, at, at some points I'm going to actually see if people can volunteer some answers to some of the questions I'm going to pose and actually coach you as well as we go through. Now, the good news is the book has a hack of mine that makes all of this, choosing, acting your ideas and getting paid easier. And that is the concept of a 30-day play project. But what is one of those? It's something where you take your idea for a business or it could be a creative project. And you turn it into a project you can, where you can produce something in 30 days. So, for instance, if you want to write a nonfiction book, you write maybe eight blog posts about different topics within that book and share them as you go along. That's, in fact, how this book started several years ago. If you want to be a professional declutterer or something, go and find somebody to do it for free in exchange for testimonial and do that within 30 days. You want to try a new niche or new angle in an existing business, because if you're already working uh, for yourself or in a business, if it's some of this going really helpful for you too, 
But if, if, if perhaps your business has lost a bit of its buzz, it's not working as well, the market has shifted or your tastes have shifted, then what you can do is you can create a 30-day play project out of a new offer or a new angle. It could be a free thing you do to get people interested. It could be a, a new paid offer of some kind. And you go out and do that process. You sell that thing, you create it, and you actually get your first customers. That's the kind of thing I mean by a 30-day play project. What you don't do is work on your website for 30 days about your future business you're going to build one day. That's cheating. That's procrastination. You don't spend 30 days researching, otherwise known as Googling for reasons why your idea won't work. Uh, what you do is you do the actual thing itself. You don't waste the time on the window dressing. And I've got a great example of this that I like to use. Uh, and it's a person called Saskia Nelson. And she joined uh, a course I used to run called the 30-Day Challenge, which was up to 350 people around the world playing out their play project at the same time in one month. And she joined that and she just left her job. And she knew that she wanted to do something around photography because that was her real passion. Her job had been nothing to do with that. And so she wanted to focus her play project on that. Now, most people who become a freelance photographer, what they do is they say, hey, I will photograph anything, right? It's a really crowded market. There's loads of people who are into photography. Uh, but most people do the worst thing possible and say, I will photograph anything. I'll photograph you, your child, your dog, your house, your product, your wedding, please God, just hire me. That's kind of the vibe that comes off. And this is the same for loads of freelancers uh, or anybody who sells their time by the hour or the day, consultants, project managers, you name it, whether you're selling to organizations or to individuals. Instead, Saskia took my advice, which is to super niche. And what I mean by that is to choose a niche within a niche centered on something you actually are excited about and have some experience in. What Saskia felt passionate about was bad dating profile photos. So she'd been single for a while, and while she was using um, dating apps to find a partner, she's now been with somebody for a long time, um, but while she was single, she noticed how bad people's profile photos were. And so she decided to niche down on that because people were either taking like really unflattering bathroom selfies um, or just, just bad photos generally themselves, photos of them in a group at a party holding a glass of wine, but don't really make good profile photos. Or, you know, if it's middle-aged men, it's the um, uh, staring down into the camera lens and taking that as a photo, uh, which is something uh, Saskia calls the serial killer shot because that's what you look like. And at the opposite extreme of that was um, the, the people who go into a studio like with an infinity curve and have a perfect photograph taken with, you know, the blow dry and uh, uh, perfect lighting. And it all looks very false. It's kind of very American style. Have you ever seen those kind of mall photo shoots? Uh, that's what it's like. And so she wanted to take photos that capture people's personality were flattering, but authentic. And so she, this was her choice. She'd chosen her play project. Well, in my opinion, you'll find out what happened later. But what I want to find out first is, we're going to talk about choosing now, who would like to start a business or launch something, but you can't choose. So either... You don't have any ideas at all, or you've got too many ideas, or you've got maybe a handful of them and you can't choose between them. People who have too many ideas, by the way, I write about those in the book. They're called scanners, and uh, I am one. A scanner is, this is a term from Barbara Sher, who's an American author. Um, a scanner is somebody with lots of ideas, lots of interests, loves, uh, loves learning for the sake of learning. Good at starting things, bad at finishing things. So if you're a scanner, feel free to type scanner in the chat. Um, and uh, I have some, I have a success guide for scanners in the book as well. 
But it, it, so scanners have a really hard time choosing. They are, um, so several people here relating Chris and Justine and uh, Eliza, Ali. So the most creative people in the world are scanners. But our problem is choosing something and actually uh, choosing it, starting it and following through. So I'm going to talk about all those things uh, today. But this is not just for scanners. This is for anybody who has problems with choosing, getting into action and getting paid. Uh, would love to do something, but no real idea what, says Caroline. An idea, but not sure it's going to make money, says Christine. Good. So we're going to address this. And this is really common, by the way. So if people think like, this is not like you, you know, this is a bad problem to admit to. It, like I say, I've been helping people do this for 15 years. But number one thing that comes up with people who haven't yet started their businesses, choosing which business to start. So um, it's really, really common. Once you've started this, in some ways, relatively easy. Making the choice is one of the hardest things. So let's talk about that. So this is the first of the three things that get in the way getting paid to do what you love and the the great thing about uh, the 30-day play project is it makes choosing easier so here's the little trick you're only choosing for 30 days you're no longer choosing for the rest of your life you don't have to sell your house um you don't have to quit your job you don't have to declare to the whole world that's it i'm no longer an insurance loss adjuster i'm now a pet I don't know what, a cat hypnotist or whatever it is you want to try it. You, you don't have to do that. You can just say, I'm going to have a little fun for 30 days and I'm going to do something. I'm going to produce something in those 30 days. Now, how do you make the choice even for those 30 days? You use the three Ps. And the first P is, you want something that satisfies all three of these Ps. And the first P is play, understandably i.e. choosing something that you're going to enjoy doing, even if it doesn't work out and make you any money. That's uh, a great measure. It's not the only measure, but it's a great measure. Because when you are just, if you do something just for the money and it doesn't interest you, it's really hard to be successful. Really hard. You can do it if you've got like rock hard um, self-discipline, which I do not have. But if you have that, you could force yourself into it. It'd be a pretty grim experience. But if you choose something you're really excited about anyway, then this is, you know, the stuff I read for fun and watch on telly and listen to on podcasts is the stuff that is related to my business. They're one and the same, more or less. I mean, okay, I would do watch films that are not about entrepreneurship and creativity, but, uh, but there's a huge overlap, which means that effectively I'm doing more work than other people but it doesn't feel like work. And that's one of the reasons why play, uh, doing something that feels like play is so beneficial. Now, that doesn't mean that your business is going to be joyous every 24 hours a day, it's, it won't be, but you want the core of your work to be something that just suits you really well, feels like it's aligned with your personality and you're gonna find it interesting and uh, exciting and enjoyable a good chunk of the time. The other reason I call it a play project, in fact, that's another thing that um, it's worth bearing in mind, is that it's about getting into play. So uh, I want to stop people sitting around thinking about things and never doing anything. If, it, it, rather than that, how about actually getting into play, getting into the ring and doing something rather than just sitting around and looking at other people doing things. The second of the three Ps <clears throat> Uh, is practiced and what I mean is you should be practiced at something whether that's from your um, from your career to date or whether it's perhaps in your spare time so quite often it'll be in your career it doesn't mean you need to do something for a play project if it's exactly a line of your career but it just means like for instance I, I'm quite technically minded so if I was going to do a play project there was nothing to do with my business I probably learn Python or I'd, I don't know what, I'd, I'd um, play around with AI, which is what, what I've been doing a little bit of recently, artificial intelligence. Because um, those are really exciting to me. And I'm also, I have a techie brain. So I'm bringing 
the, the many, many years of lifelong practice in playing with technologies, which gives me a bit of an advantage as well if I'm trying to turn this into something later. So what, have you, what are you really practiced in? If we look at Saskia, who I mentioned, who, was doing, who wanted to do dating profile photos, she'd not done photography as a job, but she was really passionate about it in her spare time. And she'd been doing it for years. You know, she's one of those people that have been, had a camera probably since she was a teenager. The third P is, um, is a problem you want to solve. And um, this is the really good test for whether you can get paid. Because if you solve a problem for people, there's a much stronger chance you're going to be able to make money out of it. If it's just a kind of like, eh, I suppose it would be quite nice if it existed, it's going to be harder to make money out of. So we're going to go more into this later. But if we look at Saskia, she was looking at people's dating profiles and felt like these people can't be getting good results um, from dating because their photos are not doing them a service. Uh, do it, you know, they're not, they're not doing them uh, justice. And so there was a real problem there, which she thought people would be willing to solve. Now, one of the things that comes up when you choose is uh, particularly for a 30 day play project is what if it's too big? So does anybody here have an idea of something you'd like to do? And uh, I'm not going to ridicule anybody's idea, by the way. Um, so, you know, it, don't, don't feel too nervous about sharing it. If you've got an idea that you would love to put in, love to turn into a business or a big project, but you feel like there's no way you can shrink it into 30 days post in the chat and I will show you how it can be turned into a 30 day project because pretty much everything can be. And it's a really good idea to do because what you want to do is test it before you go all in on something. So does anybody come into that category? Oh, he just says, I've launched my online coffee business, but struggling to take it to the next level, not making any sales. I need to connect to social media, but I don't enjoy that. and would love to have a highly recommended digital marketing company. Any advice or pointers? Probably a bit out of scope here, but I mean, we've got to find out what is your unique angle on the coffee? Is this actual coffee beans? How do you, like, what's the problem with most coffees that your coffee or your brand solves? And then if you don't like social media, if you really want to scale a business, I kind of think you have to get over that. Um, there are ways around it, but it's quite tricky. And, uh, you know, you can, I mean, you even need to get good at social media or ads or partners, because those are the three ways to actually get more leads. Anyway, so quick tip for you there. Ben says, starting a financial coaching business. Well, you then follow Saskia's example and find one person, as I'm about to tell you, and you'll be able to do that. You don't need to quit. You can do it in your spare time. If you currently got a job, you can do that right away. Diet counseling with group meetings to enable people to discuss the issues. Taking the best of a slimming group, such as group meetings, with one-to-one -one personalized counseling. I think you can do that in your spare time. You can run um, uh, a diet counseling um, group at the weekend. You could do it online on Zoom. It's probably easiest. Um, or you could do it in person if you feel like uh, in person is going to give it a lot more. It's going to be more attractive to people online in person if you'd enjoy it more in person. And what you can do is you can charge people a token amount of money um, just for the first one and run through the process once and prove to yourself and to them that you can get good results. Christine says, write books. You can, well, you could just about write a book in 30 days. It would be, you know, there is NaNoWriMo for writing novels, the National Novel Writing Month in November. Um, you can, if you're writing nonfiction, you can do what I said earlier, which is write eight blog posts over 30 days um, or five even, that pick out themes from your book. Writing a nonfiction book. So yeah, all of these things are absolutely doable within 30 days, I promise you. I mean, I, I, normally people have much more challenging things than this, like, um, you know, I want to start a restaurant. 
So the, but the version of the restaurant is, okay, can you cook your signature dish for a bunch of friends and then just do that every week until people go, this is the most amazing X spag bowl. I don't know what it is, you know, dal, whatever you want to cook until people just go, oh my God, this is amazing. Then you take that and the next step might be, um, you know, volunteer to cook that in bulk and somewhere for somebody's event and then eventually a food truck and from the food truck you might move to a restaurant and at each stage you're testing it and this, this is the point of this not only does it allow you to get started straight away and it means that you don't procrastinate you don't use excuses i don't have any funding etc um it also is a is a better way to do it, a better way to approach entrepreneurship. What we're trying to do is find the minimum viable product, if anyone knows that phrase from the startup world. We're trying to find, we're trying to prove that your idea for a thing is a is something people want. And you can do that in 30 days. So to go back to the three things that get in people's way, we just talked about the first one, which is choice. How do you choose? And the second thing is acting on your ideas. And there are two big things again, the way of acting on your ideas. One is procrastination and the other is perfectionism. You can think of procrastination as a problem starting things and perfectionism as a problem finishing things. So in the book, the F word Let's Play, it covers both of these things. And uh, for procrastination, there's a little trick in there called microblocking. And when we, I used to run this program called the 30 day challenge with up to 300 and whatever people, we would make people commit to doing 20 minutes a day of super focused time on their project. So this is not 20 minutes. It's not a normal 20 minutes. This is 20 minutes where you choose the most important thing for your project that you can do right now. And that is not something that just happens to fit in 20 minutes. It's better for you to pick the most important thing, do 20 minutes of it, even if you can't finish it, and then come back the next day and do another 20 minutes. And then what you want to do is when you sit down to do those 20 minutes work, you switch all notifications off. You switch everything to airplane mode or do not disturb or whatever. And then you just do that one most important thing and when the, what you do in order to time yourself is you get yourself a timer of some sort, whether that's an app, I call it physical separate timers because app with an app, the screen goes off. You want a timer in your eye, line of eyesight the whole time counting down from 20 minutes. And when it gets to zero and the buzzer goes off, you can stop, put away your stuff, make a note of where you got to, and then come up the next day and do it again. Now, if you really feel motivated to carry on, you can do. Uh, but the, the commitment is to do 20 minutes a day, whatever happens. And it's a, you'll be amazed what you can do in 20 minutes of real focus time where you never look at your phone. You're only doing the most important thing. You're not checking your email. There are no notifications. If you do that every day for 30 days, you will have done 600 minutes. And that is 10 hours. You can do a lot in 10 hours. Now, you would think like, okay, if I'm going to launch a business or write a book, I need more than 10 hours. Yeah, you do. You, you are going to. But let's look back at the past month. How much time did you spend on this project, which I bet whatever you're here thinking about right now, if you have a particular project in mind, you have probably been meaning to do it for weeks, months, years. It's often years. So if you've been meaning to do it for years, imagine instead that you'd actually, you know, you're waiting for the time to magically open up in your diary when suddenly there are hours of free space when you'll be able to luxuriate in all this freedom and start your book or start your business or whatever it is. And um, 
and that's not that's probably not going to happen unless you actually make it happen so at least doing 20 minutes a day means you're making progress and it's so much better like even if you even if it's difficult to fit that 20 minutes in the, the feeling that you come home from a day at work where you know if, say you're still in the job and you know you don't really like it that much anymore the feeling that you're at least making some incremental progress every day is very different but the other thing to bear in mind is that 10 hours of this super focused time is completely different from 10 hours at work in the office how much really put super focused productive time do you spend in the office where there is no notifications no email no meetings, no lunch break, no coffee break, um, no people going, hey, can I grab two minutes of your time? None of that is happening for 10 hours. I think you'll be amazed what you can do. You can launch an entire podcast in 10 hours. You can launch an entire business in 10 hours. So try procrastination. Try procrastination. Try microblocking. If you're procrastinating on getting getting going with your business idea or whatever project it is, try microblocking. The other part of this, as I said, is perfectionism. And that's the fear that it isn't quite good enough yet. You know, you've had an idea for a, you know, a blog, you start writing a blog post, but it's not quite good enough yet. So you can put it out there. So you'll come back one day or the book, or, you know, you've got an idea for a, for a business, but, uh, you can't really talk to anyone until you've got the website and the business cards and the logo and the, you know, you've thought about a social media strategy. Like you can't do anything. Like it's, it's this is all nonsense. This is really fear. It's fear of being seen, and it's entirely understandable. I don't want to belittle that at all. I feel it. Every human feels that fear of being exposed. You know, there is something very animal in us where. If you stand in the middle of a clearing and there are a bunch of animals around you staring at you, and there's somebody once said, I think it was Deborah Francis White who told me this, if they're all standing there looking, this is why public speaking is, one of the reasons public speaking is so terrifying. If they're all standing or sitting there looking at you without moving their heads, that's what animals do before they attack. So if you look at your, if you have a cat, for instance, if you look at what a cat does before it attacks a bird, is it goes deathly still, it might shake its bottom and its tail, but its head is absolutely locked on target. So that's what people are doing when you're public speaking. And that's part of the reason why it's so terrifying, because there's an animal part which just goes like, you know, that does not feel comfortable when you first see it. It's completely, um, no animal would choose to do that unless you had no natural predators whatsoever. So, um, that's part of, part of the reason it, it's a similar sense you get when you put something out onto social media. You know, you're basically throwing something to the walls. <laughs> Just you have no idea what the reaction is going to be. And that's what's really going on. It's about fear. So let's be clear. Perfectionism isn't about isn't about you saving the world from your imperfect product. It's about you protecting yourself. And I don't. I'm not giving you a hard time about that because I feel it myself. Um, but let's just be realistic about it. That's what it, it's not that you have too high standards for yourself. It's it's you avoiding criticism. So one of the ways to get around this is to think. If I post this thing on social media or if I put this website, if I put out an offer asking, uh, do you want to, you know, um, do you want to have some financial coaching with me, for instance? Uh, somebody was saying earlier. Or Louise says, you know, puts out on social media, does anyone want to join my kind of diet counseling group or whatever, however you describe it? And, um, and the, the reason we don't do that is because it feels scary. So it's worth thinking, what is the very worst thing somebody could say? Terrible, terrible things that people could say. And very occasionally they do actually say it. But if what is the worst thing they say? Like you put your writing out there, for instance, someone goes like, you're rubbish. Well, it would be a very cruel person who did that. If you did it on Twitter, it's probably very likely, actually. But, but if you did it on Facebook amongst your friends, it's very unlikely one of your friends is going to say that. But even if they did, just imagine for the moment and sit with that thought, your writing is rubbish or your business idea stinks or there's no way you could ever pull this business idea off. Well, 
Could you hear that and be okay with it? Because it's not necessarily the truth. It's just someone's opinion. If you can, sometimes that's it's worth naming that horror. What's the worst thing? And uh, there's a great quote from Stephen Bartlett, but the word he used is too too rude. But he basically said, like, it's if you there's no way you can become a hit today on social media if you want to create a personal brand. If you if you're not willing to have someone call you a insert the word for worst word you can think of. And uh, Steve Bartlett's a British entrepreneur, if you don't know, um, is very successful. So you have to be willing to have somebody call you the worst word uh, that you can imagine. And if you can, and you go like, okay, I wouldn't like that. I would be concerned. But um, I don't, if you can hold it, it's just not true. <laughs> um, or that it's just one person's opinion, then that will hopefully make it seem a little bit more doable. So that's one thing. And the other thing is you need to be willing to just make friends with good enough. If you try to go for perfect, you know, when I tell people, you're probably going to need to post on social media every day, one social media channel at least. Get good at one social media channel. If you're going to the corporate market, that's LinkedIn. If you're going for, I don't know what, over 40s and mums and whatever, I don't know what, certain other demographics, it's Facebook. If you're doing something creative, artistic, homewares, you need to be on Instagram and so on. Um, and you just want to you want to post on one of those channels every day and ideally more than once a day. And people look at me with horror when you say that, but it's because they think that they have to write this beautiful piece of polished wisdom every single time they post. But that's not true at all. Uh, you can post a whole variety of things. Occasionally posting something educational is really useful. But that's not the only thing you need, only thing you can post. You can post part of your journey and insights into how you think and the way you approach things and your own journey in creating what it is you're creating. And there's no way you're going to be able to make it if you don't, if you're trying to hold yourself to some sort of perfectionist angle. So one of the things people get really perfectionist about is I've got to have a website. It's got to be perfect before I go out there and get my first class. Usually total nonsense, almost always total nonsense and it's procrastination. So here's what Saskia did to come back to Saskia Nelson, who wanted to take dating profile photos. She was almost 30 day challenge, 350 people on it on, on a private community that I was running. And she just posted on there and said, who would like to have some dating profile photos taken for Tinder and Match.com, that kind of stuff, um, for free by me in exchange for giving me a testimonial at the end. And one woman said, yes, I will do that. And so Saskia arranged to meet the woman in London and took the shots. Um, and the woman loved the photos that Saskia took. And she gave Saskia her first testimonial. And so there she was with no website. She had her first client, okay, not paying, but first client, proved that she could do it, gave Saskia information about whether she enjoyed it as well, which she did. And clearly she could do something which people liked because she got a positive testimonial. That brings us to the third thing I wanted to talk about, which is getting paid. Now, people get really hung up on this. You get really, really hung up on it. And as I mentioned earlier, the best test of can you get paid is can you solve a problem? And I have a very specific definition of this, of what, a prob what I mean by problem. A problem is a situation someone's currently in that they feel bad about. They feel worried, anxious, fed up, bored, frustrated, a negative emotion that makes you want to change it. And this is the, the key to finding something that's going to make you money. People new to entrepreneurship fail most often because they create a sort of nice to have thing instead of a must have. And you can make money out of nice to haves because the whole luxury goods market, right? That's not really solving a problem. I mean, you could argue it's solving a problem that you buy a Gucci bag because 
you know, you don't feel special enough and it makes you feel special or something. But it, this stuff really applies much more outside the luxury um, experiences and products market. Solving a problem is the safest way to get paid. And uh, particularly if you're going to sell your services and skills, if you're going to be a freelancer, um, a consultant, psychotherapist, a like bodywork practitioner, um, project manager, of, you know, freelance, um, corporate trainer, anything where basically the contents of your brain is the product, then it's going to be much, much easier to sell if you can solve a problem with it. And the great thing about thinking like this is that it forces you to empathize with your target customer, which we are terrible at doing as humans. Um, it forces you to put yourself in the shoes of your buyer. So I'm gonna get you to do this right now. What problem do you solve in what you do or do you want to solve in your business? And I want you to express it in the following format that I'm going to put in the chat. And that chat is, sorry, that format is, I help people who feel insert negative emotion, bored, frustrated, whatever, worried about whatever their situation is and describe the situation. So I help people who feel negative emotion about current situation. To, to, to illustrate Saskia, Saskia saw that people were embarrassed by their profile photos, embarrassed as a negative um, emotion, and fed up with not getting enough matches or good enough matches on dating apps. So really, really specific, you see? What's so powerful about this, have a go, if anyone wants to take a shot of it in the chat, do it now. Um, what's so powerful about this is you're suddenly describing their life. So, you know, if anyone's ever used a dating app, you might have looked at your own profile photos and gone, oh, God, I wish I had some better photos. But I, I don't really want to ask my friend to spend all day taking pictures of me in different outfits. You know, that feels awkward, too. Plus, I, I don't know anyone who's good with a camera. You know, um, so you are you start to describe their life when you do it this way. So Brent says, I help people who feel scared about not being able to pay next month's bills and having no savings. That's really good. You've got it. You know, almost nobody gets this right the first time. What people typically do, that's really good. Well, people, I mean, not good for the people in that situation, but really good for you to actually be able to reach them. Um, and, and what that, what people normally do is they go, I help people who want to lose weight. Well, want is not a negative emotion. If you want to help people in that situation, you need to flip it around and say, well, well, how do they feel about their situation right now? And how do you describe that situation? Does that make sense? So Saskia saw, she, she had a hunch that people would be willing to pay to solve that problem of being embarrassed by their profile photos and or getting poor results in, in uh, dating apps. And she proved that hunch by first of all doing it for free and then by selling it within 30 days. And here's how she did it. She asked the volunteer client who I mentioned earlier, who she did it for free. She said, who do you know who would pay 150 pounds? I think it was at the time for this service. I don't know, it's more than that now. And the woman said, oh, my cousin needs you. So the woman put her cousin in touch with Saskia. They got together, they took the photos, Cousin paid 150 pounds. She had her first paying client within 30 days and another testimonial and still had no website. That's the power of cutting the crap and actually doing the thing you need to do. We've got a couple more people giving their uh, pitches here. I want to help people who feel overwhelmed manage this stress. So Jane, if you want to use this format, try saying I help people who feel overwhelmed and stressed, maybe you need to say a little bit more detail about their work or their personal life or being a parent or, you know, is there a bit of more, uh, can you make it a bit more specific perhaps? Amanda says, I help people who are exhausted after a long day's work, keep their dogs entertained. So 
Um, what I'm trying to say is skip the, skip what you do and just talk about the pain. So I help people who are exhausted after a long day's work and who would love to take their dog out for a walk and, and, and have a, you know, run around with them or whatever else, but they, they just need a break. And, uh, you know, they're exhausted um, and they can't face it. So that includes the negative emotion stuff and it also includes the situation. Um, so to go back to Saskia's story, here she is. She's got a first paying client now. Over the next few months, things happen really quickly for her. She started to attract press and media attention for her brand, which is at that point, um, Hey Saturday. And um, uh, it's now called Hey Saturday, in fact. She ended up in every newspaper and magazine you can, you can name. She was on the front page of the BBC News website like a couple of years ago. And this was all from starting that thing in 30 days. Guess how much coverage she would have got if she had done what most people do and said, I will photograph anyone or anything. Silk, basically. So by super niching into a very specific, quite unusual thing, because when you get specific, it often becomes quite unusual. She actually got an enormous amount of press. Of course, it helps, but that topic is really, is, you know, it's a fun topic of dating. So lots of people want to write about that. But it, you'll find that all sorts of things when you super niche, they become quite quirky almost in their specificity. And so people want to talk about those things. Now, if you fast forward to today, last time I spoke to Saskia, she had 15 or more photographers working for her. Uh, she's got people in... Uh, photographers in eight cities across the UK and three in the US. And that all came from that 30-day play project. So my advice out of all of this is to think big, but start small. And you can do this, whatever your idea is. As long as you remember these principles of the three Ps when you're choosing, play, practice, problem, that you Put everything into a 30-day play project and actually produce something. Don't just talk about it and talk, talk about doing it. Use microblocking when you find yourself procrastinating. Make sure you're solving a problem in order that you know you're going to be able to get paid. And then go for good enough. Don't get perfectionist. So that's all I'm going to say today. Obviously, the book has a lot more detail on all of the things I talked about including social media and marketing beyond that and how to scale up your business once it's working. But uh, yeah, let me know how that is for you. And um, if you want to find me, you can find me on as John Spencer Williams on pretty much every social network, particularly LinkedIn and Facebook. And uh, you find out what I do with people individually at the ideaslab.org, which is my website. Um, so we're going to do some q and I think. Is that right, Eloise? Have we still got time for that? Yes, yes, we have. Yes. Thank you, John. That, that was really, really useful, really practical. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be I mean, fielding the questions now. Oh, here, this is a good one. Um, did you pick the title yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is this this book, the sweary title. Um it is, is a new version. It's the second edition of a book that actually came out 10 years ago, which is called Screw Work, Let's Play. And um, Screw Work, Let's Play, yes, was my title. And, uh, you know, talking to lots of different people and working, out, thinking out loud with lots of creative people, I wanted to say something strong. And so a friend of a time, another mentor actually said, you know, this really ought to be the F word, work. And uh, I thought oh, that's a bit strong back then. And then, you know, second time around, we kind of decided to go for the, the stronger version. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, so you, you talked about um, procrastination and perfectionism a bit, but we've also had a couple of questions on this. So you know, if you've got a full time job and a family, you know, how do I stop just watching tv of an evening and, and and get on with it do you have any other sort of killer tips 
I think the microblocking thing will help. If you know it's only 20 minutes, it's it's easier than telling yourself that you've got to spend hours on something. So you can always come home, go do 20 minutes of your project, and then you can still watch TV and whatever else. I, I'm a believer that the habit is more important than the, spe- than the specifics. You want to build a habit into your life and then build it up. So rather than trying to go full immersion and you know give up Netflix altogether and do nothing but work in the evenings on your on your side project, it's great if you can do that. But if you're finding you're just not doing it, then you've got to ease your way into it. And, and building a regular habit is better than waiting in the hope that you're going to get an hour free at some, you know, multiple hours free. Mm-hmm. And and would you say it's fair that you know if you if you really still can't make the time, maybe it's something that you just don't love enough. Uh, I don't know if it's that simple to be honest. I mean, the other thing you can do is, um, uh, you know, I used to run group programs on this, and part of the reason is because it helps people to, um, to you know, when they're paying, <laughs> when they're paying. They usually do it. Now Now I work with people one-to-one mostly, and they usually pay me thousands of pounds. And that certainly gives a certain kind of urgency. To, people hate to spend a lot of money. I've done this. And I've just spent money on something I thought I could have done this on my own. But spending the money is going to make me, um, is going to make me actually do it. So you can either, you, you can, no, I'm not suggesting you have to spend money on that, but you need to get somebody else involved uh, you need if you've got like a hard ass buddy who's like ruthless at going to the gym and doing whatever else they say they're going to do, then ask them to be your accountability buddy and say, I'm going to have written my blog post by Friday. And if I haven't, you know, there ought to be some kind of penalty and, uh, and make them call you on the penalty. People do all sorts of things like they say, you know, he's 50 pounds. Please pay this to, here's a check for £50 to the organisation you most hate in the world. And if I don't do this blog post by Friday, you can post it in. And, you know, there's all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Love it. Yes. Yeah. To, to maybe political party. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. The political party you most despise. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. And then we do have um, another question about pricing. So, how do I know or test if, you know, my local community would, would pay, you know, what, what level of price and, and if it would be successful? How, how do you sort of test the, the pricing you might want to offer? Um, what you've got to remember is that pricing is more malleable than you think because it, as you move up the price scale, all you do is you reduce the percentage of people who are likely to pay that price. It doesn't mean no one will. So if you've only got a pool of 100 people locally and your prices are particularly high, maybe only, you know, maybe you've got 1,000 people locally, maybe only 10 people, uh, 1% in other words, will pay the price you want to charge. Now, if you're charging enough money, that might be okay. But an option sometimes is to expand your pool and then raise your prices and you can still do it in order to test it. If you sell initially one-to-one, then you can test different prices and see what people will go for. But I mean, I've got a whole process for raising your prices and um, uh, you can find on my website, but basically you want to kind of take what you do and put it into, uh, into a, a, an offer. So rather depends if you're selling services or products, but if you're selling services, you want to package your services into a, coherent offer make sure they're positioned correctly against a compelling problem and there's a whole bunch of other things you need to do and then you can often charge far more than you would think you can excellent very very useful and and for the people who are who are scanners who who they've got lots and lots of ideas and how do they how can they best pick a play project how to choose the first one and oh hit hit Aren't scanners, by definition, not good at focusing on a line of work? Um, have you got any more sort of hacks for scanners? Yes, yeah. So there's the in FYLS Play, there's a, a couple of pages on it called um, the Scanner's Guide to Success. And one of them is to 
Um, there's no wrong with doing multiple things at once, but you need to choose one. You only ever launch one thing at a time. Don't launch multiple things because um, things take the most energy when you're launching them. And once you've got one off the ground, then you can possibly start another one. But if you want to be able to uh, switch between multiple projects to keep you interested, just make sure that you know what's the number one project, and that is probably the one you're launching. So if anything has to give because something too longer than you expected, then it should be the an ancillary projects, if that's the right word, the kind of other things that are not so important. So maybe you want to you know, start a business and you want to write a book. Well, you write the book as a secondary thing. And if you run out of time, OK, you don't do any writing that week. You only do one 20 minute block or something like that. Uh, so, yeah. And the other thing is, and if you want to make a living out of it, you need to know that one of those income streams is your cash cow. And typically one of the many things you do make, makes a, a lot, like 80 percent of your money. And so you want to really protect that cash cow market it properly, put effort into that thing. Um, and the other things are kind of more about entertainment and a bit of variety. Right, right. But by the way, John Gray here says, we started posting on TikTok for fun. And a thousand TikToks later, we now have a very successful full-time business, Gray Skits. I'm going to look that up. And uh, worldwide brands and advertising agencies now use our comedy skits. I mean, TikTok's a great thing to go play on. And you can just say, for 30 days, I'm going to put out a TikTok video every day. That's quite a lot if you're not used to it, but it's doable. And you'd be amazed where things like that will take you. There's a currently TikTok rewards, um, rewards you quite heavily compared to other social networks. Wow, wow. Um, and also, can you use the 30-day play program for just new things within an existing business? Yeah, yeah. So what you can do is, first of all, you can try it. If you think there's another niche or a, like a, a possible secondary income stream within the business, then you can do that as a 30-day project. So you could say, for instance, okay, I'm going to create and run. The, the lightest thing would be a free webinar or, you know, I'm going to do, it uh, depends what your business is, but I'm, I'm always thinking of services because that's most of the people I, I help. But, um, you know, a free webinar to show your expertise. If you're creating a product, you could do something where you feel like this is going to test the interest level in this product. And I'm going to actually get people to buy it um, within 30 days. Um, and we'll do a limited run. So if it was a physical product, for instance, it will be a limited edition. And then after that, maybe, okay, that worked really well. So we can do a, a variation on this and make it less limited. Mm. And last question, this, I think this is a bit of a toughie. What about for those with no real ideas? <laughs> I, I assume that the book sort of that gives you inspiration and, yeah. and helps you sort of narrow down on something that appeals. Yeah, there's two phases to choosing an idea. One is idea generation and one's idea evaluation. And you don't want to confuse the two. If you don't have any ideas, the chances are you're confusing the two. And you're, what you're doing is probably you do have ideas, but you've ruled them all out. And so I call that idea pinball. For, it's too complicated to explain, but in the book. Uh, but it, it means every idea you kind of bat out the way and go, that's not going to work. I mean, another idea, you bat that out the way. Instead of that, what you should do is um, write down every possible idea you could pursue. And then you take your best three out of them and you find out the pros and cons, and you work out how to maximize the pros and minimize the cons. And then you're usually fine with one of them out of there at least is quite doable. But you know, every idea you think of, particularly if you're a kind of negatively minded person, which I used to be, you'll, you'll find a reason why it won't work or you can't do it. Um, and you need, to get, uh, uh, you need to get around that by doing this, by not throwing all your ideas out and try to fix ideas rather than to discard them. Like it, like it. Great, great. Well, um, you've mentioned the, the book's website, but I think um, there's also some free resources on there for people to download. Yeah. Um, we've also got your Facebook page if, if people want to stay in touch, um, LinkedIn, and you're also on Twitter. 
so yeah. thank you so much john that's been that's been really useful um and i also want to just plug our our next session in the new year um our next one will be on the thursday the 26th of january at 2 p.m uk time and our book of the month will be seven skills for the future by emma sue prince and her masterclass will be on hit the ground running in 2023 the skills that will help you to succeed so that sounds pretty exciting um thank you again so much and um, thank you to everyone attending thank you to everyone watching the recording um please sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already and we hope to see you next time thank you thanks all right